welcome um, to EDECO in London today. And today I'm going to present to you a new paper uh, that I wrote with Noel and I uh, on the pricing of green infrastructure and whether realized returns and expected returns can be compared or can be related uh, for this, uh, this class of assets. Uh, so this paper is coming out today, I think, returning to my colleagues. Uh, it's really released today. And you can download it from our website later today. All right. So the, the questions, the question we're going to be looking at, the research question, um, is that of what's driving the returns of investments in so-called green or sustainable infrastructure. More often than not, it is argued that green or sustainable infra, sustainable investments in general have a better financial purpose, have higher returns than other types of investments. So this opens two questions. Uh, one, is there any empirical evidence of superior performance by more sustainable or greener infrastructure investments? And here you see that I'm already using uh, a sort of relative scale here in my, in my question. Is it matter of being a bit greener or a bit less green or, uh, and, and how that actually uh, corresponds to superior performance as we've seen the market performing in the past decade we look at about 10 years of data and if that's the case what explains this outperformance maybe it's some kind of specific factor that has something to do with green investment maybe not um, in any case, if there's whatever explains it, can we expect it to persist in the future? So that's the, the idea that there's something fundamentally uh, different about greener investments, and that, that explains their performance systematically and on an ongoing basis and on a broader basis. Alternatively, this performance, if it exists, could be the result of uh, transition in investor preferences, meaning basically a lot of demand. So more investors want to buy more green infrastructure, more green assets, and this results in higher prices, therefore high realized returns, but not necessarily high expected returns. In fact, quite the opposite. So let's see if we can try and answer these questions with the data at hand. Um, so I'm going to follow the following uh, plan. First, um, we're going to answer our first question, which is if we look at green infrastructure, uh, what are the historical returns? of something I'll define in a minute, which is extremely green. So there's no question about the fact that this is a good proxy of green infrastructure. Uh, and we'll compare that to its, I guess, most natural market benchmark. Then we'll compare this green infrastructure with something we call brown infrastructure. And so we are again compare historical performance, but this time between two portfolios, one of very green infrastructure and one of very brown. So as you can imagine, it's going to be coal and gas and uh, fossil fuel fed investments. Uh, and then we'll compare to, so we'll do an, an exercise that actually quite common in the equity literature at the, at the moment, uh, which we can call green minus brown. So we'll try and build a green factor portfolio by having a, a, an investment uh, a strategy, which is long green and short brown and see what sort of returns we get. Um, and then we'll try and see if this green effect or this green factor that we've been trying to uh, document, whether it has something to do with the demand for these assets, as well as the systematic risk factors that might uh, explain prices and everything. Well, then we'll have some to do with it. So I'm going to spend the next half an hour, 45 minutes on this. Uh, if you have questions, please ask them in the, in the chat box um, in the webinar. Uh, hopefully, I can answer a few at the end. Uh, if not, we'll collect them and we'll also answer them in writing um, if, if necessary. All right. So, first, let's look at the performance of green power infrastructure over the past 10 years. So, what's green infrastructure? Um, I have a good example of green infrastructure in the, the data that I have to hand. Uh, I can look at an index which would be solely made of wind projects and solar products, okay? So it's pretty much the greenest type of power infrastructure you can invest in. Um, in a world with constant energy demand, it's 
has negative emission because it's replacing other uh, sources of energy. Um, and it's obviously not emitting more. Well, a little caveat here, but it's, it's not responsible for a lot of emission at all. So we can safely say that this is a very green and probably the greenest type of uh, type of infrastructure that we invest in. Uh, another word about these uh, these assets, these wind and solar investments, which we're going to be looking at, usually they have project finance, meaning that you create a single entity, a single company to hold this asset, and um, the contracts that usually characterize its uh, its revenues, they're not all contracted, and there are uh, some of these assets that actual actual purchase agreements, power purchase agreements. Others have different types of revenue models, but all in all, they have quite stable and predictable revenues. Uh, they have a finite life. They last for 25 years, 35 years. They have a fixed capacity, right? Usually, they're, of course, they, they can be repowering as well, but uh, in general, they're not expected to grow as a business. You build a certain amount of power generation capacity, and that's the project. And so it kind of resembles a bond when you look at the, the cash flows uh, that you're, you're, you're going to be discounting to valuing this asset. Uh, of course, this, the coupons are risky. Uh, there's no guarantee of payment. They might be quite different from one uh, month or one quarter to the next. But overall, it has uh, characteristics that are quite similar to, uh, to a bond. And this is important because it will help us to understand uh, perhaps more easily what's driving the performance. Because for a bond-like asset, our performance, because the upside is limited, and again, this is not a business that's going to grow a lot, uh, it has a finite life, etc. Um, our performance with bond-like assets tends to come from demand, high demand for, uh, for these assets, so capital gains effectively, because demand leads to a lower yield. So the discount rate, the market discount rate keeps decreasing because there's like more and more, more demand and investors holding these assets uh, book capital gain. And this is what why they outperform the expected return of uh, that, that particular bond, or in this case, perhaps that particular wind power or solar bond. Right? This outperformance also um, should disappear if excess demand disappears as well. Which suddenly there's less excess demand. Everybody has bought some uh, wind and solar projects, and the risk of satisfied with the amount of wind and solar projects that they have in their portfolio, uh, excess demand would increase, and uh, the impact on on yields and the impact on on, uh, on the pricing should also uh, diminish. Okay, so to uh, represent this. Uh, green infrastructure. I have an index called Infra Green, which I'm pulling from the Inframetrics platform. Um, and this is an index which um, tracks 100 unlisted wind and solar projects worldwide. It has, uh, at the end of this year, uh, last year, sorry, it was uh, $22 billion of, of market capitalization. And I'm going to compare it with what's probably a, the most natural benchmark, which is core, what I call core infrastructure. Here's a core infrastructure, another index that I can find in the Infrometrics platform and that has more assets in it that have, have lower expected returns effectively. And so these, these, uh, these indices are built by, built by sector, they're built by level of expected returns. Um, and these are the ones that have expected returns that are not very, not the highest. It's the first two quarters of expected returns, meaning they're the safer, more predictable, uh, also more in demand um, assets. So, if I look at the the data that I have here, I'm looking at the monthly local currency returns. Okay, over a period of ten years, um, this infrastructure 100 global core index that I have. So that's 100 uh, core assets worldwide. It has a fair bit of renewables in it. I can also compare it with a core plus index just to see how it compares with a, a higher risk uh, benchmark. And here you can see that in a core plus index, so assets that have higher expected returns, I have about 25% of renewables, uh, and they are probably either in emerging markets or uh, at the greenfield stage. In any case, this would be my typical benchmark for the green infra, or infra green, should say. Um, index. 
Now, as you can see, this infrared reading mix has a higher return. So this looks like it's more of a percent of monthly return, but it has a higher monthly return uh, on average over the past 10 years than core and almost the same as core plus. And its sharp ratio is quite high. We, this is the style of, um, of what you might call a bull market sharp ratio. When you have sharp ratios that are high, like this, is, then there's a lot of demand for these assets. In fact, um, it has also positive skewness. So what that means is that the distribution of returns tends to be uh, skewed towards positive returns. So there's lots of high, high positive returns in the distribution of returns that we see over this period. Uh, contrary to Global Core and, and Global Core Plus, which have negative skewness. So these indices in the history see at, at some points sharp drawdowns during crises like the global financial crisis or the euro debt crisis or COVID, etc. Um, but the infra green index sees uh, extreme positive returns. So it's obviously it has quite a different profile and this also explains why the sharp ratio is so much higher. So clearly there's something going on with the performance of green infrastructure assets compared with what might be a natural market benchmark for infrastructure. So if we look at the same information, but graphically and over time, so here we're just plotting the uh, cumulative return, uh, so an index of uh, those three indices I was telling you about, the infrastructure green, uh, which is the blue line, should be a green line, but it's a blue line on this chart, uh, and the core and core plus, and so core is the, uh, the bottom line here, the uh, purple one, and core plus is the pink line, and clearly, Green infrastructure has been performing much better than core, much, much better. Uh, for a long time, it was also performing much, much better than core plus, all the way until pretty much until 2019, the end of 2019. And by then, after that, core plus begins to outperform uh, green infrastructure. But clearly, for a long time, we had a very strong performance of the green, uh, green infrastructure segment even stronger than what's not its natural benchmark, which is core plus, which would not be project finance, contracted, uh, bond-like assets. It's much more likely to be um, utilities, toll roads, merchant power plants, etc. Right? So given the level of risk, if we look now at the annualized risk, so again, this is all monthly returns, uh, but, so I'm sorry, annualized monthly returns, Annualized risk and annualized return for these three groups of assets. We see that infrastructure, the green infrastructure, has higher annualized returns than everybody else, almost, uh, and much lower risk. So, on a risk adjusted basis, it is super attractive compared to both global core and global core plus. So, I'm going to remove that bar at the top of the. Oh, oh. Okay, so we've established that we have a very good, very attractive, realized performance for the green infrastructure segment. Now I want to compare green and brown. And so we're going to look at two, because after all, maybe comparing this core with not the, the, the most useful or the most informative thing. So I want to look at two ends of, two opposite ends of the green spectrum. On the one hand, infrastructure, green infrastructure, so the one I was telling you about, wind and, and solar, and on the other hand, what I would call brown infrastructure. So we are looking at a portfolio, but this is not an index that you find in the Infometrics platform, but it's a portfolio of coal and gas power projects only. Um, clearly, this is brown. Okay, so if you look at the contribution that these types of assets have or make to a global uh, Greenhouse gas emissions, according to the IEA, conventional power is the first contributor contributor to the total energy related emission. Right, so this is super brown, and it's always carbon positive. I mean, it doesn't matter how carbon efficient it is. It doesn't matter what taxonomy you put them in. They're always going to emit some uh, CO two and other greenhouse gas uh, gases, and therefore. They are always browner, more brown than my green portfolio. The point here is that I'm, I can safely say, given the characteristics of these assets, that on the one hand, I have 
the portfolio of assets that is definitely quite green and on the other hand definitely quite brown which whatever you your position might be on the classification of gas from a taxonomy EU taxonomy standpoint or uh whether you can have uh, gas and, and the power for example that's greener because it uh has uh it emits less and there's a bit of carbon capture taking place etc it's always more brown right, or less green than my wind and power portfolio. So I can safely say that I'm comparing two things that are opposite, um, opposite portfolios in terms of greenness. All right, so I have a good proxy of green, which is wind and solar, and a good proxy of brown. So this compares a good proxy of green versus brown. Okay. I'm gonna use my infra green index for green, and this brown index portfolio, it has about 80 assets in it, uh, over the same period, and it represents about twenty-eight billion dollars um, of market cap at the end of. Uh, sorry, that's at the end of last quarter, actually, twenty twenty-two, and it's uh, it also you know, goes. Um, well, we can look at the data of the past many years. It's, it's all over the world. Okay, so let's let's try and compare these two data sets. Um, the realized returns in the brown segment, so coal and, and gas, have actually been higher than the green one. Uh, but before 2016, it wasn't like that. It was the opposite. So there's a switch in the this story. For quite a while, until 2016, the green index, the green portfolio, is performing quite well, better than the brown portfolio. And since 2016, the performance of the green portfolio slows down effectively. Uh, and that of the, the brown portfolio doesn't. So the brown portfolio overall over the entire period. So if I look at the entire period here on the left, 2015, uh, sorry, 2011, 2021, I have, um, uh, sorry, I have, uh, higher monthly returns for the brown portfolio, uh, but all ever so slightly higher. And uh, otherwise, you know, volatility looks pretty much the same. Uh, sharp ratios are very close as well. Uh, so they're actually quite difficult to disentangle these two in terms of pure financial characteristics if you just look at those 10 years of data. Um, again, during the uh, first period, if I cut this data set in two time periods before 2015 and after 2015, I have higher returns in the green segment uh, during the, the first. Um, the first uh, period, and I have lower return for the green segment in the second period compared to brown. Okay, uh, and again, the, the risk profile is fairly fairly parallel. So we could try and try and dig a little bit deeper and understand why or rather what's driving these different returns. Um, because again, if we look at this on a so if I look at this cumulative on cumulative basis, the same two portfolio, green and brown. Uh, you can see that for a long time, so my blue line, which is the green portfolio, uh, is, is higher than, than the other one. So it's we're, we're performing, performing better. And only around here, around 2020, is there, is there this switch, right? Where realized returns in green power begin, begin to, to slow down and uh, brown power starts, continues to perform a bit better. So we have two periods during which this is quite quite noticeable, during which there is um, either so this is on a cumulative basis, but if you look at the returns on a on a on a period by period basis, where the returns are actually higher in green, in green investments is between 2012 and 2015, roughly, and between 2017 and 2019. Right? These are the two periods during which we really see our performance. Uh, of green versus brown. Now let's try and understand why that's the case. Because <clears throat> if we dig a little bit, so we can we can separate the capital returns from the income returns in this data set. Um, we can see that a significant part of the green infrastructure performances come from capital gains. So during that period, I have uh, capital gains, green infrastructure capital gains uh, that have had uh, a much a uh, higher level than the brown capital gains. But on the income return side, it's the opposite. Green income returns are lower than brown income returns. So basically, the green portfolio is performing because 
uh, the price of green assets is going up all the time, whereas the uh, brown portfolio is performing because it's paying a lot of dividends. The cash yield is high. Okay, so we've established now that we have, um, sorry, now we've established that we have high performance historically of green power versus the market. We have uh, this story between green and brown by which green performed quite well for a long time, but then there's a kind of switch again. Um, and in the end, brown power is performing higher, it's higher return. So now let's do a typical exercise. Um, to try and understand what's driving the expected return. So until now we're looking at realized returns, and clearly there's something that uh, to do with, with the capital gains in particular of uh, the green power segment, doing specific periods in particular, I was showing you these two periods in time during the past 10 years where green really performed really well. Um, but now on an expected return basis, is that still going to be the case? So can we, can we expect uh, this uh, level of performance to, to persist? Especially since we've seen the switch, it's not necessarily given. So we're going to do a typical exercise, which consists of trying to build a green factor. If there's something specific going on about green, there should be a, uh, a factor that is there. It's, it's uh, characterizing this green investment that you can't explain in any other way. You can't explain with regular factors. You can't explain with um, uh, what normally drives the market, uh, but it can only be explained by adding an extra factor. So we'll try and do this. So to do this, we build a, a green minus brown portfolio. So it's a very classic exercise. So here I'm just showing you the very standard, uh, so it's sort of a reminder for those of you who may be less familiar with this, how uh, in finance you can build a factor mimicking portfolio, as it's known, um, by uh, taking um, characteristics of the assets, for example, there's a very well known factor called the value factor, also a size factor, etc. The value is a very well known factor. And you take assets, in fact, you take the excess returns of, um, of assets that have certain characteristics, so for example, high book to market, and you subtract to them the, the returns of a, a portfolio of assets that have uh, low book to market, for example, and that the difference between the two, so you long high book to market, short low book to market, the difference between the two gives you a return. And that return is the return of that effect, that factor. Right? Uh, so we can call this effect, or this, this factor return lambda, for example. And then if you regress your, your portfolio, your factor making portfolio against uh, the portfolio of interest is something that you're trying to explain. So it could be an index, it could be another portfolio. Uh, you should find its beta, meaning you should find the relationship between that return, for example, a value effect, or as we're going to do now, a green effect, and the returns of, of the portfolio that you're looking at. Okay. So we, we do something like this in this paper to try and uh, decipher whether we can explain the returns of, uh, of the difference in returns effectively between green and brown assets in terms of uh, standard asset pricing factors or something else that we can't explain. So in the case of infrastructure, we've done lots of work on this. We have a, a paper which summarizes these, these findings. We know that there are some factors that explain very well the returns of infrastructure investments. For example, there's a size factor, uh, there's a leverage factor, there's a profit factor. So we know how to build these factors and we know how to um, We've documented how they are present in the returns of infrastructure companies. Um, <clears throat> and so effectively, for each one of those factors, we have a premium, we have a, a return, a factor return, and um, we have an exposure uh, for each asset, uh, which you, or, or, or for, a given, uh, for a given portfolio, um, which is uh, the uh, relationship between that factor return and that portfolio or the return of your, of, of your portfolio. Okay. So the question we're asking here is, is it possible that differences in expected performance between green and brown assets are explained by differences in standard factor exposures? So the, the betas that we're, we can detect by regressing those um, green minus brown portfolio against standard factors, or is there something else that we can't we can't detect, we can't explain. 
especially we need to build three minus brown portfolio. So we do that. So we have the returns of our green portfolio, it's the infra green index. We have the returns of our brown portfolio, it's all those uh, coal and gas assets. And uh, if greenness is priced in expected returns, we, it should be picked up by this green minus brown factor. Because so basically, we're looking at the, the difference between the returns of green and the returns of brown. So, can we explain the difference or not? And uh, if we can't explain it again, it might be because we found a new factor. Spoiler, we're not going to find a new factor, but anyway. Um, so if you build this uh, this green factor, so that you, here you have the returns of all the factors that we look at in this in this paper. Uh, and this on the right-hand side is the GMB, so the green minus one factor. So these are the returns of uh, the difference between green and brown. And as you can see over that period, it's, it's negative, meaning if you buy green and you sell brown, uh, you have a negative return. So in the end, over the entire period, brown performs more because the difference is negative. But between the uh, during the first period, during 2011 to 2015, that difference is positive, and later it becomes negative. So there is this switch. Of course, it was in the data. We've seen this before. Okay. Point is that um, we're going to take this as our green effect, if you want, and we're going to try and explain this as as a function of all the other factors and see if there's anything left that we cannot explain. And so this is the green minus brown factor. So this is uh, brown is the, the brown portfolio again. So this is just showing you the returns over time, and uh, without it's not not on a cumulative basis, but on a rolling basis. Uh, the brown portfolio is pink line. Uh, the uh, green portfolio is uh, this one. And the blue line is green minus brown. So as you can see, there's this period during which green minus brown is positive. So green has higher return than brown. It's the same period I was showing you before, between 2012 and 2015. And then there's another period here where the difference suddenly so becomes negative. And then it kind of goes back up and it kind of becomes almost zero. So there's almost no difference anymore, but obviously green is performing better than brown because, or better than before, or higher than brown compared to before, because during this period, again, uh, that effect is not negative or almost not negative. And this corresponds to those two, those two periods during which we saw earlier that uh, the, the green portfolio was uh, outperforming the brown portfolio. Right? So that's what I was describing just now. Um, so this portfolio, the green minus brown portfolio, why did it, why does it have the, the returns that it does? Why does buying green and selling brown have uh, such a, you get such a number? It's because each of those portfolio, I mean, each of those uh, components of the, of the effect is, or represents a different exposure to different factors. So here I'm showing you, what these factors are, what these exposures are. So, for example, that's the size, it's in log because otherwise it's very big numbers. Uh, but what's interesting is that the size um, over time, um, but also across those portfolios, are not very different, um, nor um, is, are the other factors. Meaning the difference between green and brown is not explained particularly. It's not, they're not exactly the same, of course. But they're not explained particularly because either uh, the green or the brown assets are very different in terms of size or leverage or profitability, nor um, because that uh, these characteristics change a lot over time. And so this would explain why over time you, you get sometimes a positive difference, sometimes a negative difference. In fact, they're quite good for this purpose, these two portfolios. They are very comparable in terms of how exposed they are to certain risk factors. What's changing over time is the pricing of those risk factors. In other words, the B test in my pricing equation are quite stable and quite consistent uh, over time and, and also consistent across the two portfolios, green and brown. What's changing over time is the lambda, it's the pricing of those risks, which in the end is the expected return that the market prices for these assets. Right. So now if I take my green minus brown portfolio and I regress it against uh, the usual factors that I was telling you about, the size effect, the leverage effect, the profit effect, et cetera, I, I can explain some of the returns. 
um, with these factors, as, as I should, because that's that's what explains the, the, the returns. Um, and in this case, the difference in return between green and brown, but I can't explain all of it. I have this intercept here, so for alpha, um, which is negative, of course. So uh, that's because, as you know, over that whole period, the brown assets actually outperform the green ones. Um, and I can't, in significance, it's definitely insignificant, meaning it's, it, it, I have to keep it in my model, uh, and I can't explain it away with uh, standard factors. So it's another effect. There's something else going on, which explains the returns of green versus brown, which is not the size of the assets, but of the, the, the leverage of uh, the assets and the, the, the premium, the, the, the yield, the profitability, et cetera, et cetera. So what is it? And, is it a green factor or is it a green, a specific green effect? Right, so we have these um, quite clear and quite strong effects, for example, of size or leverage in explaining the difference in returns between uh, uh, green and brown, but we still have that intercept here that we can't get rid of. So let's try and explain this in a different way um, by looking at demand for these assets. Because I was telling you at the beginning, may, what can explain the uh, performance of a bond-like asset is how much demand there is for it. So what we found so far that realized green infrastructure returns have been higher than brown. Okay, realized, especially in those two periods during the 2012-2015 period and 2018-2020 period. Um, if we build a green factor mimicking portfolio, so green minus brown portfolio, we find negative expected returns. Okay. So green expected returns are lower than brown expected returns. Higher realized returns, lower expected returns. It makes perfect sense. Of course, again, if you think about bonds, that's exactly what should be happening. And when we control for other typical factors that explain the valuation, play the price, and therefore the returns, the expected returns of, of these assets, we find something that we can't get rid of, a negative effect. So is this some kind of systematic green effect? Um, green expected returns are lower than brown expected returns, but the realized green expected returns have been comparable, if not higher than brown returns in some cases. Okay? So this is something that um, is a bit puzzling. Uh, you, you should don't account for demand, which is why we're not trying to to look at that. So that, that's what I was just explaining. Um, if, if, like bonds, uh, if you perform better, when it's because yields are compressed, and yields are compressed because presumably because there's more demand. So let's let's try and see how the market demand for these assets might explain this difference that we're seeing. All right. So here I'm showing you the weighted average cost of capital of the same asset. So I have the green. Project 100 green projects in the infrared green index and the brown projects in the brown portfolio. And for all of these, I can pull the uh, weighted average cost of capital for all these companies from, from inframetrics and then uh, plot that over time. And what we see is that so the, the purple line here at the top is the weighted average cost of capital of brown assets. Um, the, uh, Blue line at the bottom is the weighted average cost of capital of green assets, so my 100 wind farms and solar farms. And in the middle, the pink line is just the broad market, so it's the average for the global data set. So what you see is that there's a difference of cost of capital between green and brown, okay? That's one thing, but more importantly, that this difference increases a lot over time. And so in fact, the weighted average cost of capital of brown assets uh, at some points increases and overall over this whole period, while there has been some yield compression in some period, hasn't really compressed at all. Whereas the, the whack of green assets uh, also goes up and down, but overall over that period it has compressed a lot and it keeps compressing. What, what would be the difference between the two keeps increasing? So one is compressing much faster than the other. In other words, there's much more demand for green assets than brown assets. Maybe not a bit surprised. And so all infrastructure investments have seen a reduction in their cost of capital since 2011. This is the, the, the pink line here in the middle, which uh, shows you that the market as a whole has seen yield compression. Again, no big 
use for uh, most investors in infrastructure, but green power has seen a much larger increase. And so just to be a bit more specific, over that period of 10 years, global infrastructure has seen a reduction in WAC of 177 basis points. Um, green power, 263 basis points, and brown only 11. So there's an increasing wedge effectively between the cost of capital of green and brown. And so this high realized performance of green infrastructure has been accompanied by a significant decrease in its cost of capital. And I was showing you earlier that the performance of the green index is actually driven by capital gain. Okay, so this is interesting because this probably explains a lot of what's going on with our data in terms of why is green performing. Now, if we plot the difference, so this is the, uh, the WAC spread. So the difference in WAC, the difference in cost of capital between green and brown. Um, that was the, this wedge I was showing you earlier. I'm not just plotting that on uh, as a line. Uh, you can see that we have again the same two periods 2012 to 2019, and then over here 2018 to 2020 or 2018 to 2019. And so you have these two moments when uh, there's a big, it's not. It's not a constant decrease, but there's a big decrease in WAC overall uh, compared to periods where the, the, the difference between the two is either flat or even increasing in some in some in some period. Okay, so uh, overall the difference is consistently negative. So we have this increasing spread in WAC between the two two green and brown portfolios, um, and it has widened now to reach. Uh, from 100 basis points of that data girl, 350 basis points of difference in WAC to it. So yield compression explains the high performance of green infrastructure. It seems to be like that. Now we just want to try and see if we can explain this quantitatively. Can we link the yield compression with the excess demand um, to see how if, if that, uh, or rather, can we explain this yield compression by measure of excess demand? So I'm, when we say uh, the yield is compressing because there's lots of demand for these assets, we know that's the case, but let's try and see if we can actually measure this. So we, in the paper, we build a proxy for excess demand of green assets. Uh, we look at the market for wind and solar projects again over the same period. And we look at a whole bunch of transactions uh, and we make a ratio. So this is a measure of the liquidity of the market. Uh, we make a ratio of secondary to primary deals. In other words, um, in a world where there are not a lot of infrastructure, not a lot of green infrastructure assets to buy, we have uh, more primary investments than not. Um, and probably, and this also makes sense if you think historically, uh, 10 years ago, there weren't, there weren't that many wind farms or that many solar farms for investors to, to buy. So they were rare. and. Uh, most of the assets were new assets that were still being built or just had just been built. And then as the market develops and becomes more liquid and investors start trading also secondary, uh, also existing, existing assets in the secondary market, um, that's a, in a sense a more liquid market. There's uh, the, you have the ability not just to, you don't have to, have to wait for new wind farms to be built to be, to be able to invest in one. You can actually buy one from somebody else. Okay. So we build this measure, uh, it's uh, 772 billion of investments or uh, 922 gigawatts of, of solar and wind investments over that period. Uh, so it's almost 3,000 investments. Um, and, uh, and, and, and sorry, and, and as, as part of that, we have, uh, I'm sorry, I, I missed one bit. <laughs> we have 6,000 green, sorry, the new investments uh, uh, that are greenfield and 3,000 brownfield investments or secondary market investments representing 220 billion of our investments. So uh, then we take, uh, we take the ratio of the two. So this is presented either in dollars or the capex or in megawatts of investment. Um, and it's standardized so that the mean is zero. So it gives you a, a sense of just a dynamic over time. Uh, and whichever whichever you, you prefer, whichever you want to look at, either in, by dollars or by megawatts installed, you have uh, a clear 
dynamic here by which basically in those periods between especially between 2012 and 2015 um, where we saw a very steep decrease in the cost of capital and very significant capital gains in our green space there isn't that there's relatively less liquid so there's relatively fewer secondary market transactions relative to all the primary transactions that, that, that they have that they're seeing. Uh, investment is uh, still building up in those uh, in, 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 um, portfolios and there is excess demand. And then this effect kind of tends to weaken. Uh, during this period where we saw uh, less uh, excess demand, well, less compression in yield and less performance of the green index. So this is data that has nothing to do with the industry, right? It's just primary and secondary uh, transactions and uh, a number of transactions or, or volume of transaction in the in, in the green uh, infrastructure sector. And it matches the picture I was showing you earlier in terms of yield compression and performance quite surprisingly. And so it then goes on like this. So then obviously as time passes, there is more and more uh, liquidity, you might say. There's more and more secondaries relative to primary. Um, and that, that, that measure matches quite well what's going on in terms of the cost of capital. So much so that if we regress our green minus brown excess returns against, um, for example, this green liquidity index, um, we find a very significant, very strong uh, statistical relationship. Um, just uh, just that there's a strong statistical relationship between the green minus brown portfolio and the wax spread that I was showing you on the end. You can also use that as a like this wax spread, the red correlated with this, this measure of, of, um, of liquidity. Um, and likewise, this, this green liquidity index can explain uh, statistically explain uh, uh, in a great deal of the excess returns of the infrastructure green, so just the green leg of the green minus brown effect uh, quite well. So there's a strong there's a strong statistical relationship between the two. In other words, we can uh, safely conclude that the evolution of liquidity in the market, the availability of these assets corresponds to moments when um, the Cost of capital of green assets compressed and green assets performed because they were uh, in high demand. In other words, there is no other effect going on. There's no green, special green effect. Once we have control for everything, um, so if, if I have this, I add this effect to my regression, um, the outperformance that I had before disappeared. Right? So I can explain now. Uh, controlling for the yield compression basically i can explain all the returns that the green portfolio uh, has and that the green minus brown effect uh, shows um, and in fact one of the things we we do is that um since we can explain this and explain all the returns we can also remove that effect so i can predict the effect of the returns of the green minus brown portfolio of that green effect and effectively set the, uh, the coefficient for uh, that yield compression or for that market liquidity to zero, as if as if it hadn't happened. And then I see if I do this, then so you recognize here the brown, so the purple line is the uh, green line and brown portfolio I was showing you earlier. And if I remove from the, the prediction of the model uh, the impact of uh, that yield compression or again the impact of that um, market liquidity i have no effect anymore basically all that outperformance especially the one that uh, the, the sort of high returns higher returns that we saw during this earlier period where there was little green stuff to buy and everybody wants to buy some is gone so this kind of shows that um the, the, if you build a counterfactual portfolio which for which you remove the effect of excess demand, you remove the effect of yield compression, um, you don't get this historical performance of the green portfolio anymore. It's gone. Right. And this is the same view, but on a cumulative return basis. That's um, at the end of the, the paper. So to conclude, 
we found that green power projects, so when we started the Indian Access in 2011, we have green power projects that have expected returns with this discount rate, about 8%, and brown power projects that have expected returns of 9% or so. 10 years later, they have had respectively realized returns of 16% in one case and 17% in the other. Uh, and the difference is, uh, very well, the, the reason for these numbers, which look very close, are completely different. One has high returns because of that yield compression effect, because of high demand. The other one has high returns, not because the yield compression is given, not that much, uh, but because um, brown power was in a position, brown power project were in a position to pay very significant uh, dividends, and so I have a very high question. Um, so high historical performance for green power is explained by a significant compression yield. Um, and that's especially true uh, in between 2012 and 2015, and a little bit after that again. And this corresponds to the capital gains we see in the uh, in the uh, in the data. As I was saying, the performance of brown power is driven by cash returns and a lot less regular compression. In fact, you could also Consider that this excess demand for green assets uh, has decreased a lot, at least if not disappeared. Excess demand and not demand. There is, there is demand for green assets. Um, because if you look at the portfolio of different investors in infrastructure, you can see that they already have a lot of green uh, investments. So this is the uh, peer group survey that we do every year um, for peer group uh, indices. Uh, this is a survey we do with the Boston Consulting Group. In fact, this, it's ongoing now uh, for, the, for this vintage, but this is the one we did last year. Um, and whichever type of investor you look at, so whether you're looking at you know, investors in different parts of the world or different types of asset managers or pension funds versus insurers or whatever, uh, most groups have, so this is the proportion of different segments in the infrastructure portfolio of each one of those care groups, um, most have 20 to 30% of the infrastructure. The only ones who have a less are the uh, Australian superannuation funds. Uh, they only have 10%, between 10 and depending on how you look at it, by, by region or by type of fund, uh, Australia and New Zealand or superannuation have 9 to 10% of green infrastructure in their portfolio. Everybody else has 20 to 30 percent. What that means is that, of course, as these infrastructure portfolios grow in absolute value, the uh, investment in dollar terms in green investments and green infrastructure will increase. But in terms of in relative terms, they all have enough, you know, basically. So they all have enough, meaning that there isn't this kind of, um, and also the market is, in, in, there's plenty of assets to buy and sell. So there, there isn't this, uh, Strong excess demand that led to the compression in, uh, in yields and the, uh, the the kind of historical performance that we saw. Um, more conclusion. Then I'll do a little poll. Um, so the impact of, of on performance uh, of shifts in demand for green and brown assets uh, we cannot equate this with some kind of special green effect. So again, you look at the historical data, green performed really well, better than almost everything else. But that's because the nature of uh, the investors that were present in this market and the level, the level of preference for investing in green assets changed, shifted, and that led to higher prices effectively uh, and, and large capital gains. But now this has happened. And look, look going forward, this high realized performance, historical performance uh, in the green power market also means that expected returns should be low because now it's expensive. Um, and, and also now everybody has, so it's not rare. Um, to understand this actually, you can look at the econometrics platform, which has forward looking returns in wind and solar projects and other things, um, which we update every month. Uh, and, and obviously, it's uh, the levels are so it's now six, seven percent. Um, it's much lower than uh, than the historical the, the realized performance. So this is important because 
Um, sorry, I'm talking about this in a second, but it's important because you can't build an allocation today or a policy or a strategy to invest in green infrastructure today on the basis of those realized returns. Obviously, realized returns are no guarantee and expect a future returns. And in this particular case, realize the returns uh, in, in the green space can be explained away again by all the usual pricing factors. And there's, there's when you have excess return because assets are leveraged and they're profitable, et cetera, et cetera. And because there was a lot. Of um, incidentally, you may be interested to also see it. We have a new paper coming out soon, which will highlight. Uh, the shift in risk profile of this asset. So this is a, a new topic, but we have a paper which looks at how when the market, when the power system is dominated by uh, wind, and particularly wind investment, how does that impact the risk profile of the investment? Um, so this may be an interesting reason why there'll be a shift in the other direction in the future, not because There'll be less demand for green assets, but because the risk profile of these assets is going to change uh, to the extent that uh, the market will price it. And precisely because in a, in, a, in a system where you have a lot of wind and not just wind as a sort of extra, um, the dynamics between the, the generation assets and the grid become quite different and the volatility of the system becomes completely different. So, but this is another, this is another paper, but I'm just highlighting it here because it's coming out soon. And uh, it, it, this, this could be, for example, a reason why you may have a, another shift in, uh, in preferences for uh, green investments and therefore a repricing in the other direction. Now, let's do a poll. So I'm gonna ask uh, Antonia to launch the, the poll. Uh, I have two questions for you. First, do you think that green infrastructure should have lower returns or higher returns than brown infrastructure in the long run? By now, hopefully, you're convinced <laughs> that, uh, that uh, about the answer, but uh, it would still be interesting to, to have uh, a poll of the, of the crowd. And I can see we have quite a lot of, of answers. So excellent. Mm. Okay, carry on. We want a large sample here. We have uh, okay. We have more than one hundred answers, so that I think that's that's pretty good. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, seventy percent of you think that green infrastructure should have lower returns. 30% are still in the camp of those who said the green infrastructure should have higher returns. Now we don't know why, so let's let's see why. Um, maybe infrastructure, green infrastructure should have higher returns because you think it, the, the demand will keep coming, so the capital gains will keep happening, the yield compression will keep happening. I'm not convinced by this, but maybe that's what you think. Or maybe you think that green infrastructure has, should have higher returns because it's risky. Uh, riskier than than, uh, than maybe it's perceived to be, um, and so my second question is about that, uh, and and the, the related topic that I was I was just mentioning, uh, the new paper as well, which will release soon. Your views on um, can you do the, the second question, please? Um, as renewables become more prevalent in the power generation system, will they become less risky, riskier, neither riskier or less risky? Or you don't know. Let's see what the, the perception is. So this is a, a world in which there is not only, again, uh, wind uh, or solar to add to the system when uh, uh, we need extra power, but a system in which is dominated by wind. And and by this, I mean in the next 10 to 20 years. So presumably without storage uh, available widely. Okay, so we have okay, a good selection of answers here. 
and we have a majority of the 50% of you have said that it's less risky. The more renewables you have, the less risky it is. Okay. Uh, and then about a third of you would say that it's riskier. And the other 25% that it doesn't change anything. Almost none of you consider that they don't know. Okay. Well, we can have that debate uh, another another time during a, another another event because when, when we release this other paper, um, I think the answer is that it becomes risky. Um, there's, there's multiple phenomena in play here, uh, but what we've seen in the data, without revealing too much of that new paper, which this is uh, about to be published in really a couple of weeks. Um, what we've seen in the data is that the, the volatility of the uh, power prices increases, um, and you have a lot, whole lot of technical issues, but particular curtailment. Uh, so the, the inability, effectively, of, of the wind uh, wind projects to uh, sell their output, uh, which aren't necessarily a bad thing business wise, but create a lot more uncertainty. So. This nice predictable risk profile that we were um, we kind of associate with renewables was not so nice and so predictable in the future. It was uh, more of a, of a risky, a risky game. But this is clearly not the dominant opinion. All right, well, um, I have used all my time. Um, I think we have a few questions. Yes. So I don't have time to answer them, but uh, I will go through them and provide you with a uh, set of uh, written answers, which will then send around along with uh, our usual follow-up email um, today or tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you for your participation as well. There was many of you, and we have a very large sample for our poll as well. Um, and again, uh, you can find this paper on our website today or if not today tonight um and uh, we look forward to uh, to your comments and i hope you i hope you read thank you